On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects. A warm welcome to the On the Tape podcast. Danny Moses crinkling some papers. I'm Guy Adami, always joined by the aforementioned Danny Moses messing with his papers. And of course, Dan Nathan. We have a treat today. And I guess this just off the top of my head. Dan said, how many times do you think the great Mike Wilson has been with us over the years? And I said, today will be the seventh time. And then you said, let me check with Persnickety. Perplexity AI. Perplexity. <laughs> let me check with Perplexity AI. Per, he or she didn't know. Amanda Diaz did. Yeah. And it turns out Mike Wilson will be his seventh time. And it's thrilling that you hear Mike Wilson. But before we get to that, because you know I like music, Danny Here we Moses. go. You're running out. I don't know how you have any songs left. There are a lot of songs. Oh, yeah. I have an 800, Mike, I have an 865 song Spotify playlist. There are no songs from this band on my playlist. This is one of those bands, like there have been 75 people in this band over the years, like the Doobie Brothers. They're not, they're no Doobies or Brothers, but there are a lot of them. Chicago is one of those bands. Yep. I'm not a big fan. However, what goes up? Yeah, well, must that's interesting. Down. That's interesting you say that. <laughs> No, but the song that came to mind with Mike Wilson is their hit in 1976, If You Leave Me Now. <laughs> Mike, if you leave me now, you'll take away the biggest part of me. You are my guiding light. You're my North Star. I'm speaking for the it's dance it's now. So don't <laughs> leave us, dance. Mike. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Lucky seven. Lucky seven. Lu this well, is it, it. It might be lucky seven. <laughs> yeah. First of all, out of the other six, at least half, if not four out of the six, you were right on everything. And I still don't think you've been wrong yet. So that's just me. <laughs> Maybe I just look at it that way, Mike. So. Well, four out of seven, I'll take. Four out of seven is better than 50%. You can yeah, make money with that. Right. And we do make money. It's good. Well, we're sitting here on a Thursday. It's in the wake of, we'll start with the obvious. It's in the wake of what was an extraordinary earnings report by NVIDIA, an important company that now has a market cap of $1.9 trillion. Seemingly, the entire market is hinging on what they say and do in terms of a stock. And I, I get it, I guess. But just thoughts on that, and then we'll sort of get a bit more granular. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I was uh, kind of joshing with uh, with Dan on the way in. It's it's, it's trading like a macro event. Yeah. Um, you know, it's almost like the Fed came out and said we we're cutting 100 basis points, and all of a sudden, you know, it's just get me in. And so I understand why NVIDIA is up. I mean, I, that makes perfect sense. Uh, put up another good quarter, and I don't think that was a surprise. It was kind of right down the middle of buy side expectations, and people got a little nervous going in. So that makes, you know, total sense. But what doesn't make a lot of sense is all of a sudden now it's equity risk on, not just like for other stocks, but like Japan, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, Europe. It's like, wait a minute, is that really, like is NVIDIA really that critical now for the entire global stock market? And I think the answer is partially yes. So, you know, it is, like you said, the, the entire, you know, kind of market ecosystem is hinging on sort of one company's uh, guidance and 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 also one area of the market, which is artificial intelligence, which is exciting, um, but boy, I mean, it's uh, it's driving a lot of uh, euphoria. I think yeah. what you just said is important. I think this particular stock in video is just as important as whatever Jerome Powell says at this point because of the wealth effect the stock market's having, I think, right. and the credit conditions and easing of financial conditions and so forth. You can just feel the euphoria. So if something bad were to have happened yesterday with NVIDIA, you'd be hearing more about you got to cut rates for no reason other than the fact that the market would be down. And I think that's what we're kind of Pavlovian at this point. Yeah. It's, uh, but it is, I mean, I've been doing this a long time as you guys have too. And, and I was talking to clients yesterday about this. Like I had no idea how the stock was going to react, but that's the most important thing to the numbers as usual. And I, I was saying all day to folks, like, I, I don't remember a time in the last 35 years where one stock was, you know, this important to kind of the entire market. I mean, in, in the nineties, we had a narrow group of stocks in the seventies, we did nifty 50, but we're literally down to the one name. And, and, I, and that doesn't really tell us anything about the direction of the market, like what's the next thing, but it's it's just unusual. It's an unusual setup. Yeah, I guess, Mike, what I'd say is it's also a narrative that saved the market in 2023, if you think about it. You know, so ChatGPT, you know, was introduced in late 2022, and I, I think a lot of software stocks started reacting to that. Obviously, Microsoft was, was a big one, and just kind of that MAG7 name came about because I think a lot of investors thought these are companies that have been spending billions and billions of dollars in machine learning. That was part of their DNA, and they were going to be in the catbird seat to take advantage of it. And then all of a sudden, you know, you had these semiconductors. People started looking at the picks and the shovels and that sort of thing. But it really did remain really um, concentrated. Mike, I guess my point is, is like, 
you know, AI, at least large language models, they don't save the economy, right? They've definitely caused, a, you know, like a CapEx sort of boom and, and some of these companies that probably lost some good reasons to kind of invest in really expensive tech. So I, I guess my point is like, how does this play out from here? Because I was very shocked when I was thinking about the buy side whispers, what they came in at and what they guided to that the stock is up 15%. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely shocked. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was nervousness going into yesterday's results. That was part of it. And you were kind of offside. So like I said, I think for the individual security, I think it makes sense for the broader market. I think it's a little more a little more dubious, but look, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think what's going on in the stock market is 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 strange. Let me let me set the table a little bit. It's something we wrote about last week, which I think is a bit of a differentiated view. I, I think we're in an extremely unusual policy mix setup. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, we have a situation where front end rates are actually quite tight and quite restrictive for most businesses. Okay, and most consumers, and we're seeing that right. Anything kind of interest rate sensitive, anything that is requires financing to get done or, you know, low mid-end consumers are really sucking wind, quite frankly. And we see that uh, all across the economy. And the reason why the Fed can't proactively cut is because there's so much fiscal stimulus, right? So we have this incredibly tight front-end policy on, the, on rates. Then we have this extremely generous fiscal policy. And then on top of that, they're paying for it with generous liquidity, all right? So that money has to go somewhere. And so like, I don't really have a, I don't really have a bone to pick with with where the market's going or where the money is going. I mean, this has been our call really since November, which is that we continue to want to be in kind of high quality growth stocks. It doesn't have to be just those five. It can be broader than that. And you really want to avoid kind of low quality, you know, small caps, bad balance sheet companies that aren't self-funding. And quite frankly, that pair has traded extremely well. Now, the market is also traded well because the market is geared to those types of names, okay? So maybe it's got a little stretch and we can debate that on what's, but the, the internal, like the equity market is not as crazy as you think, given all of the uh, liquidity that's gone into the system has to go somewhere and it's choosing these pockets. Now we can debate valuation, have things gone too far. I mean, maybe in some cases for sure, some cases, maybe not, maybe there's new names that can kind of join the club. Okay. And we'll see how that goes. But I agree with the premise of your question, which is, you know, artificial intelligence and as a firm, we've been you know, kind of front footed on this. A lot of our analysts have been very constructive on it. But like, I think as a firm, we agree, like this is a, this is a productivity driver, like later. Like, this is not going to happen this year. And if you listen to a lot of companies, what they're saying is 2024 is sort of a transition year. And really it's about 25, 26 and beyond in terms of the diffusion of this new technology into the economy. So I, I, I do get excited about what it can do longer term. We talked about this last show but I'm not excited about what it's going to do for the broader economy in the next 12 months. And that's why we continue to be very bifurcated within the stock market. We want to avoid kind of the businesses that are, that are, that are struggling with the higher rates. Okay. And we want to kind of, you know, go with the businesses that are, are immune to higher rates. But it's not just about one stock or one company. It's not because there's so many secondary ramifications of what they're saying and who they're ordering from. So it does spread. So it's not about one company. It's that's about, right. it's about many. And you know, it's hard to think about what if it, they had just met expectations and just maintained guidance and or, God forbid, they gave the same numbers in guidance and the stock traded down and the narrative would be great company, a little bit expensive, not enough time to take some chips off of the table. It's just nuts to me how the stock price warrants creates the narrative rather than the actual numbers themselves. And the one thing that I came away with uh, from the call was a setup into the fact that there's going to be on the next generation of chips, a potential supply constraint situation going on with them. That to me is a setup for trust us. We, and maybe it'll be true. People will, will give them benefit of the doubt. I don't think this is a benefit of the doubt type market. And we've seen companies, God forbid, that miss yeah. or a guy down. To your point, it's it's so within the narrative of the overall S&P and the Dow and all this stuff, all the Nikkei, Euro stocks, whatever it might be, within that underneath, there's still a lot of sec like a sector rotation that's been occurring, which I know you do focus on, which yeah. I obviously want to get into. And you've been right on in the late cycle what you want to own. And you talk about companies getting rewarded for having pricing power. So I think we should get into that a little bit because forget about all the noise, oh, S&P targets. I think that stuff is somewhat meaningless in, in, the, in this setup, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, the S&P 500 target like at a time and a price is, mm -hmm. is stupid. It's the dumbest exercise anybody would try to do. I mean, time, a price is one thing. Okay, I have a target. I think it's undervalued or overvalued. I think the price is X. But like to try to figure out the exact date on that is silly. 
So I, I agree. We spend more and more of our time now trying to just figure out relative value because that's what that's what active that's what our institutional clients are doing, right? They're trying to outperform the index. They're not concerned about the index. They're trying to find the names that will do better than the index. And that relative value trade has been very consistent really for the last 18 months since we've been in this unusual policy mix. So Mike, we we you know, listen, you come on our pod like as guy said, you've been very generous and you know, you you come on CNBC and it's funny, you just mentioned to your institutional clients who really understand like what you are solving for. It's got kind of that relative performance, right? And so what we speak, Guy and myself, and I don't know if you caught Danny Moses on the Fast Money Desk last night. Um, it was pretty dope. Um, but, you know, we're, we're often speaking to a lot of self-directed individual investors, right? Yes. And so like, and th that's a big difference. It's like, I, I find you have a very difficult job because oftentimes the loudest people or the folks on Twitter or whatever who, who don't like always get the game. You know what I mean? Like why you're there to do what you do. Guy and I and Danny are in a different situation. And so, um, you know, like, like shout out when we say you've been right about this, you've come on every quarter with us and you've talked about some of these relative sort of situations and the rotations and the like. And so to us, it's very important. And we just try to actually be a broader mouthpiece for that a little bit. Okay. Um, the one thing I want to say is you just mentioned this, look at the Russell 2000. Look at small caps. They are down on the year. On a day today where the S&P is up 2% and the NASDAQ 100 is up 3%, okay? So up 6% and 7% respectively on the year. The Russell's down on the year and it's it's up less than 1% today. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about what that is saying to you on an absolute basis. Forget some of the relative stuff right now. I mean, it actually epitomizes our call mm -hmm. to a T, which is that these, you know, the Russell 2000 is a low quality index, okay? Like I think a third of the companies don't even make money. Mm -hmm. Their balance sheets are trash. Um, they need access to capital. So they're not self-funding a lot of them. Now, some are very good companies within that. So I, I'm not saying all small cap companies are, are hosed, but the, the index itself is just, it's a great instrument for what our view is, which is I want to be underweight things that have, you know, bad balance sheets, need access to capital, maybe can't get it at, at a good price, not self-funding, don't have pricing power, don't have scale, can't control their costs on labor. Okay. Like they're, they're like in the, the vortex of this, of this unusual policy mix. No different, by the way, than say a middle income consumer mm -hmm. versus a wealthy consumer, okay? The the top 1% have never had it so good, okay? Or top 10%, quite frankly. And it's the same thing in the stock market. So the stock market is kind of a reflection. It's the same idea, which is that this policy mix is just, it's just, it's not a great setup for the average consumer or the average company. So the Russell 2000 is underperforming for the right reasons. And that's why I think it will continue to underperform while we're in this late cycle environment. And that's also a typical pattern. We see that every late cycle. Michael, last time, December 1st, I believe you were with us of last year. Ten-year yields were on the way from 5%, as it turns out, down to 3.8%. We were sort of in the middle of it at that point. We've since rallied back in yields to north of 4.3%. I mean, the bond market continues to be volatile. What are yields telling us, if anything? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is actually the one thing that I has been confusing, not the one thing, but one of the main things that have been confusing to me, which is that the rally that we saw in the fall was all about financial conditions loosening. And it was a function of two things. The Federal Reserve, I'm sorry, the, the Treasury decided to issue less coupon, which kind of squeezed the back end. And then the Fed acquiescing to that need by pivoting and saying, we're not raising rates anymore. And that, and, and then the, the back end of the, of the bond market was, it was game on, right? So we priced in six, maybe seven cuts at the at the maximum, and the ten year yield followed that directly, and so did PE multiples for the market. And we look at the S and P five hundred, but generally multiples went up. And to your point, now we've gone up fifty basis points in a straight line as a function of those cuts getting priced out. Okay, so that makes sense. But multiples have stayed where they are, so it is it is kind of perplexing to me. I would have thought we would have given back some of the multiples. That's been basically, that's our call on the S&P while we have a lower target than when we're trading. We think multiples are too high as a function. We think rates probably are, are too low because we don't think, and we've had this call all along, like our economists have been saying all along, the Fed's not cutting in March. They're going to only cut probably three times this year. And that's kind of where we are now. And maybe it gets even less than that. So I think what the, what the bond market is saying is that we priced in too many cuts. It's unrealistic to think they're going to cut six or seven times with inflation where it is and the economy kind of hanging in in the stock market at all-time highs, there's no need to do that kind of cutting. And you know, in the fall, people were saying, well the, well, the bond market's doing the Fed's hiking for them. Now you could say the bond market's doing their cutting right. for them. So they don't really need to price in more. Like They're probably happy at 430, 450, quite frankly, 
particularly since it hasn't really had a, a negative impact yet on the overall economy. And so once again, what I, I really want to leave this po- at this point with the listeners, which is the, the setup that we have right now is essentially crowding out the private economy. Okay. The government is just growing. It's, it's a massive blob and it continues to grow. And what that's doing is it's crowding out the weaker participants in the economy, whether you're a consumer or whether you're a business owner and operator you're being crowded out by the government. They're making everything more expensive for you. They're making the cost of capital higher, cost of labor, because they're hiring a ton of people too. And, and that is a very difficult operating environment. And that's just where we are. So small caps and um, are, are going to underperform, as we talked said before, and rates probably stay a little stickier on the upside. So we're reaching kind of the end of the, quote, lag effect of the Fed hiking rates, right? We're going to be, you know, but, oh, it's going to happen in 18 to 20 months. I mean, we're yeah. getting really yeah. long in the tooth there. And you made a comment here at the opening and in your note this week about, that the fiscal policy is making Jerome Powell and the feds work a lot harder and it will make it a lot harder, right? Because you have unemployment still at a low, what are they going to do here? And what is the direct impact? Is it, is it the spending by the government? What are you looking at to see that the fiscal presence, because from quantitative tightening perspective, they still only have gotten down to 7.6 something trillion. It's not like, yeah, they've taken off a trillion in the last year or so, but that's not it. So what, what is it that you're looking at exactly? Budget deficits. I mean, budget deficits are running six and a half percent, which is, you know, a record level for when you have full employment. So it's a, it's a very, once again, it's very unusual. We've never seen it in our careers to run that hot of a deficit when you have full employment. Now, uh, even Jerome Powell said on 60 Minutes, he, and I was, you know, he was pretty forthright. He said, look, w- the fiscal situation is unsustainable. And he mentioned it as a potential concern. And, and actually rates have gone up a bit since that interview. Uh, partly a function of the fact that he's kind of alluding he wasn't going to cut maybe as early as people thought. And maybe maybe the bond market is starting to consider this idea that the fiscal situation is unsustainable. So what I'm looking for as a market practitioner is, does the bond market care? Like, does, is the bond market going to start to press back on this policy, this heavy fiscal hand or not? Now, in the fall, they were, right? In the fall, we saw that. And that had a negative implication for stocks. Maybe they've figured out this beautiful formula where they use these alternative ways to fund the government being reverse repo. By the way, back on the QT thing, this is interesting, just statistic, which I was kicking around this past week with someone. So they're doing $60 billion of QT. All that means is they're not reinvesting yeah, $60 runoff. billion, but there's $100 billion of runoff. Well, it's $35 billion mortgage-backed securities and 60 treasury, right? Right. But it's a hundred, but the mortgage stuff isn't running off, right? So they're only real they're they're basically a lot, they're basically buying coupon now with the with the 40 billion, the hundred minus the 60. And so that's another way where they're kind of coming up with creative ways to sort of fund the government. And it's working. I mean, look, hats off. I mean, they, you know, they pulled off this uh huge fiscal impulse. They found a way to fund it without disrupting the bond market. They had a little you know, bobble there in the third quarter, but they've got it back under control and the markets seem to be okay with it for now, for now. Right. Okay. So I'll sort of push, not push back, but let's amplify that because over the next 11 months, there's $8.9 trillion of government paper coming due that needs to be basically sold to somebody on top of which I think there's a trillion and a half dollars or so of deficit that needs to be made up. So let's just round it and say $10 trillion dollars. I know somebody's going to buy that. I totally – there's always a buyer of last resort. The question is at what yield? And I think, you know, again, I don't want to make a big deal out of a 20-year treasury that we saw this week, but clearly it was not a very good auction. And I think that's going to be the norm going forward, which is one of the reasons I've thought rates will continue to go higher. Thoughts on that? No, I mean, look, this is probably – we wrote about this last couple of weeks, which is this is probably the biggest macro risk that I see – Outside of a hard landing, if we don't, you know, we're not going to have a hard landing, then it basically rates get out of control at the back end because they're, it, you know, the market requires a higher price mm-hmm. to take it down. And, you know, I don't know what the magic number is. I mean, we think it's around 440. Like at 440, if we get up through that level, um, I think the equity market will take notice and multiples will, will come in. It's not a crash, but like, but that's a, it, that will be a headwind again, like it was in the third quarter. Um, and that probably, once again, like I said, is the biggest macro risk I see. Right. And so l- l- let me bring it back to the stock market again, because w- without, and, and, and you know, everyone was focused and you said it yourself, NVIDIA's report was kind of like this big macro event. Okay. So the stock is nearing $2 trillion in market cap. It's up 15%. It's barely seen a downtick all day. Okay. So here we are Thursday into the close and it's drawing, uh, dragging a lot of stocks, you know, up with it. There, There's a, a bunch of, there's pockets of weakness that don't look that particularly broad in the rally. We're going to be at 4-4 four, four 
in the 10 year and the not so distant future. Okay. Like, so, so let's think about that. What if we have these inflation readings continue as we've been talking about here, guys been all over this one for like a year. You know what I mean? So what you've been saying, pesky and persistent, mm -hmm. there's a scenario, Mike, where actually stocks, the machines, whatever's drawing, like, 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 like causing some of this behavior might like react the opposite way in a very violent manner. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I'm just saying, what, what would that, what would the cause for that? Would it be a, a number of other hot, um, you know, economic prints, inflationary prints, that sort of thing, rates just kind of continue to, to move this and the narrowing of the stock market that actually becomes, in my opinion, more dangerous. Well, sure. I mean, I, look, there's a lot of reasons why rates could go up. There's other reasons, there's reasons why rates could go down too. I mean, I, if we, if we start going towards, you know, hard landing scenario for whatever reason, I mean, rates But will, that will be bad for stocks. Of course. I mean, that'll be right. bad but, for but I'm, But I'm saying is I think it's more likely that rates go up not because growth and inflation really accelerate. Mm -hmm. I think it's a funding question. I really think that this is, you know, it's a 30% risk, okay? It's not like a guarantee it's going to happen. But to, to me, there's a lot of complacency that the back end of the bond market is fully under control. The term premium is very skinny. Okay. There's not a lot of term premium built into the back end of the bond market. They were starting to do that a little bit in the third quarter. And to guys, you know, question, which is right, like, like somebody's gonna have to buy all this paper. It will get sold. It will get bought at what price? And we're going to find out. And I think, but that, 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 that's a, that's a situation that's going to evolve into the summer and um, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But I think from my, once again, from my standpoint, if, there is a threshold. There's a point where rates get to a point where the market all of a sudden says, oh, gosh, you know, we're actually not getting the cuts and financial conditions are actually going the wrong way again. And I got too much risk on. And we get bond vol and then you get equity vol. And that's how it happens. It doesn't have to be a crash, but, you know, yeah, that, but that's a correction. And then, look, at, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, we've talked about this for seems like forever, but the earnings picture is just, you know, it's very unimpressive outside of a uh, you know, a group of companies that have done extraordinarily well. And it just amazes me how many people will run around saying, oh, earnings are great or they're good. And, you know, that, you know, the companies are really performing. And I can name you probably 25 companies off the top of my head, like large mm -hmm. companies that have really struggled in the last two quarters. And it's, and, and the layoff announcements are getting, are getting pretty, are getting pretty broad. Yeah, at some point, you know, to Dan's point, what what's gonna, could it be a failed auction? We saw a week 20 year auction. It's a one off. We've seen very strong auctions other than that that have sure. occurred. It'll just trigger something, and all of a sudden, you know, it's staircase up and it's elevator down, and it feels like we've had bits, we've had fits and starts with that continuously over this. I've called it the last six months, and we had it last week where the S and P dropped, and then of course regained, and now is making brand new highs. And so, who knows what it's going to be? And I think that the equity investors, for the right reasons, are like, I don't care right now. First of all, in their mind, ten year yields how that impacts Nvidia. They don't. There's no impact in terms of how it impacts their right. The balance sheet's fine. It's not a big deal either way, and. I think you bring up a good point, and we talked about when we kicked this off today, was that underneath these kind of top five or top 10, whatever it is, there are a lot of stock picking going on. And you have companies that are being literally left for dead that are probably good, you know, no one wants to own them there because they're not sexy enough. Um, and then stocks that are obviously being bought that are value stocks. And so to me, and I've talked about this, and I think I've talked about it with you, I'd love you to echo this, and I think it's really important that retail investors understand this, that the institu institutional investors that are measured against indices, the bigger a stock gets from market cap, the more that they have to chase for better or for worse. However they want to set it up, they're forced to do it. And so are you sensing that still? I mean, you go through periods where they're like, oh, thank God we pulled in. I don't have to do it because I'm, I'm, I'm holding my nose and, and you know, doing it. Where are we in that? Right? And how important is that to the kind of the flows that are in the markets, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's critical. Well, there's, there's multiple forces that you take the index up and then it can also take up the biggest constituents within that. So as you know, we've had this huge movement from active to passive investment, right? So you have all these ETFs and futures investing that go into the S&P 500 or pick your favorite big index, and then it gets fed into the largest constituents. You also have systematic strategies, okay, and vol targeting strategies that basically they're just bots. And if the, if the price momentum is up, they have to buy more. Mm -hmm. They just chase. That's another form. And then the third one, which you mentioned at the outset, is these stocks are such big parts of the index, you, you can't even own the weighting because you're not allowed to own more than 5% of certain names. And we now have four or five, six names that are above that. So even if you wanted to own the market index weight, you can't uh, by charter. So that's creating a whole nother situation that's worse than we've ever seen, meaning 
like even in the nifty 50 in the late 90s there weren't many stocks above five percent of the index so that's a that's a that's another constraint um and yeah i think most active managers hate this market um because you know it's really really hard to beat um if you can't own 30 percent of your portfolio and five stocks and you have to go pick stocks. Now we've had success actually over the last four or five years. It doesn't get a lot of press on the tube, but like, I mean, we've outperformed the S and P by 900 basis points per year. Okay. And we've been underweight this group like massively the whole time. So you can do it, but we've also been very concentrated in that book. Okay. That's how we've done it. We've been very concentrated in things that we really like, but you can't run a, a big fund with seven, eight, nine percent positions. You know, it's just, it's, so it's a, we're cheating a little bit too. So that's that's the dilemma. And um, but yeah, it, it feeds on itself. Um, today I'm sure it was one of those days where oh my goodness, this thing's up another fifty percent, right. and I'm I just got to add. That's just how it works. For the better part of a year now, maybe longer, we've seen across a swath of industries layoffs. Seemingly happens every day now. I think the last major one was Cisco a week or so ago. Seemingly, if you get below the surface, and you alluded to this earlier with the government jobs, but a lot of states, I think 80% of this 40 states out there are now seeing an uptick in their unemployment rates, but it's not manifesting itself in the numbers that everybody pays attention to. So the politicians and the pundits can say unemployment rate, record lows, the employment picture looks great. Something doesn't make sense to me there. And I just personally, this is just me, I just think it's a matter of time before you start to see a dramatic rise in a way that nobody expects. And that is probably what the Fed wants to appoint, but not so much. Thoughts on that? I think there's two things that are going on that are hard to sort of understand if you're not looking at the data. The first one is that the government is hiring a ton of people. Mm -hmm. So the government, so if I look at uh, private payrolls as a percentage of total payrolls, it's down to 80%. That's very low. So government Payroll numbers are now 20% of new jobs. That's a that's a big number and probably continuing to grow. The second piece is the immigration, right? The illegal immigrants are working. Um, and this has been a real windfall for a lot of businesses that can employ these people in low-skilled labor. Um, and I think if we hadn't had the influx of all these immigrants coming in who are willing to work, and there are plenty of them, uh, at, at way below market wages, mm -hmm. you would have probably you know, seen more layoffs in some of these lower end, or they sure, sure as heck wouldn't have been hiring and, and, and growing their businesses. So that's that's been a supply side positive. Like if, if all the bad things about like, you know, letting illegal immigrants in and not processing them, the one positive is that it's added to the labor force at the low end in a way that has actually helped the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's really hard to measure, but we see the data and um, you, they don't distinguish between legal and illegal, but you see that foreign born uh, you know, people are making a much bigger part of the labor force and it's really surged in the last three or four years and it has to be the migrants coming over. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, uh, again, on um, just more white collar layoffs we're starting to see again and we saw them at the start of 2022. We saw them at the start of 2023 and here we are now. And, you know, one area we're seeing it, I guess, increasingly more and now we saw a big deal announced in the credit card space, but in the financial space. And we know that, think about technology, you think about AI, you think about, you know, really where the productivity gains, there's gonna be taking out tons of layers there. So like, I don't think banks can fire people fast enough, uh, like to be frank. And think about last year, we had a half a dozen banks just go away, big banks in, in this country. And those jobs will never be replaced once they get to the rationalization, that sort of thing. But here we are, we're coming, Mike, to the one year anniversary of SVB and the like. You know, when the rates were going higher, it was a huge problem for some of these banks. Rates are going higher again right now. So let's talk about financials a little bit, because we know even some of these very large money center banks have like, you know, huge mark to market losses. Right. And they're held to maturity um, portfolios. And like, is this going to be a, a story of 2024 again? If we start to see rates go up, you know, guy thinks that they could get to 5% in the 10 year. Well, look, I think that, I mean, they've clearly plugged the hole on deposit flight. I don't think we're going to get another bank run. I think that there's there's comfort in the system that the, the government will be there to bail out depositors. Um, that, that's not going to that's not going to be how this manifests itself. My view the whole time has been the following. It's really since the that first weekend in March when this happened, is that what this does is it constrains the regional banking system's ability to create capital, okay, and create loans. So it's a credit crunch. And that's what we're seeing now. So it takes a while to manifest itself. So it took almost two more quarters, but now we're finally seeing negative CNI loan growth. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So that's that to me is the issue. And once again, it's just another reason why you want to be underweight or not buying companies that need access to that type of capital. There's a lot of businesses in this country that rely on regional banks' ability to lend them money, refinance existing loans, and they just can't do it. You know, they're, and they're not going to do it in the way that they were because they don't have the capital base. And even if they don't take a write down on those bad loans that they've made, they know kind of where they are and they're going to be like, you know, they're telling the loan officers, listen, we're not making any new loans. We're not going to re-up that loan over there or it's going to cost them a fortune and they're not going to be able to afford it. So that to me, like the CRE concerns, yeah, it's there. It's going to be very persistent, but it's going to take a decade for that stuff to they're going to kick the can down the road. But what it does is it, 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 it throws a wrench into the money creation machine. The Fed can create the balance sheet at the M1 level, but to get M2, you need the bank's creating money and and they're not making loans. It certainly feels like the bigger banks are certainly the safer place to be because they'll be the beneficiary, like we saw last year, of just absorbing any of these issues. And CRA, they're going to be on some of the smaller regionals that are much higher percentage of the balance sheet. Right. So I think that's why people are now paying a premium for JP Morgan and so forth. And obviously with this M&A deal and Cap, Cap One Discover, which is a big deal, whether it gets approved or not, I don't know. But certainly it gives people, I think, at least a feeling of safety in large numbers. And that's right. they've proven over and over again that they'll give the banks what they need, the bigger banks what they need to help, you know, facilitate the system. So maybe now is a good time to kind of go into the sectors because the one sector which I cannot find on your sheets <laughs> is energy. Yeah, I don't see it anywhere. <laughs> I know it's the most cyclical and it takes a big input component. But Mike, this sector has been left for dead. So who's the beneficiary if we do get this sell off? What sector? Sorry, guy's looking at me because he's he was going to ask this question. Yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, where does energy sit in your You guys world? are long energy, I guess. Right? No, I just, I, it's, uh, listen, it's unloved. No, I know. I get how the earnings work. It's not, a, they aren't earnings stories. They're, they they are eventually, but you, this is, you buy them at trough. These are asset stories. Yeah. Right. yeah. So talk to me. Yeah. About and I, I would throw in material stocks as well. So what, what's kind of perverse about the AI boom, which I think, you know, is happening is like, it's, this stuff consumes an enormous amount of energy. I mean, like incredible amounts of energy. In fact, we're already getting brownouts in some parts of the country, some parts of the country saying, no data center here, please, because we don't want to have our citizens short on electricity. So, I, I, I mean, like the idea that, you know, we're not going to be using fossil fuels for the next, you know, probably the rest of our lifetime and size is insane. Um, I do think that the, you know, the Russia-Ukrainian conflict provided a, a little bit of a relief valve for a period of time where oil was allowed to now move to China from Russia and maybe even Iran and like that there's more global supply. But now, like if you really are a believer in a recovery, Okay, like if you think that we're going to have right, a reacceleration, no yeah, or China or re-stimulates, and we actually have a like a reacceleration, you must be buying, you know, things like energy and chemicals and material stocks. Okay, the fact that they're not rallying, okay, tells me that the recovery is not. We're not. We're not going to have a big acceleration. That's that's our view. Right? As a house, we think we're going to have very punky economic growth. We're pretty negative on you know China doing any big bang sort of program, and and so therefore. Like things that are really geared to strong global economic growth, like energy and like materials, will continue to languish. That doesn't mean you can't. Like I actually think you should be buying individual securities within energy. In fact, I'm looking at some myself and material stocks, which I do own some because I'm not worried about the next six to twelve months. Like I think these are five year, like right. big big winners. And let's not forget, like coming out of the pandemic, um, the biggest winners in many people's portfolios, including yours truly, were in the material space. Okay, so like these things, these things can tenfold from here. Some of these names, some of these particularly small mid mid cap names. Now, the issue they have is that they're also the balance sheets are a little sloppy. Okay, the smaller mid cap names, so you have to be a little bit careful. But but like this is where stock selection comes into play. But your general thesis, a general idea, what you're thinking about makes total sense to me. But of course, nobody's going to go there because the price momentum is not no, there. Sexy. And and so one thing that we do do we try to do is we look at twelve month price momentum. And what we can do is we can see when relative strength is starting to lead certain groups into uh, relative price momentum and and 12-month price momentum. Because we know that once it crosses over, you're going to get a surge of flows. It's not there yet. We made that call, by the way, at the end of 2020. We said, hey, all these cyclical names are going to move into the 12-month price momentum bucket. And then for the next four months, it was just a rocket ship. So we're watching that. It's not there yet, but um, you know, we'll let you know when it, when it happens. A lot of similarities to 99, 2000. More, I think, on the tone of the market, the ignoring valuations. It's fine. It can go on for a very long time. But something I saw in the last week just rang the bell in this for me. And that's this super microcomputer, this SMCI. Mm -hmm. 
Let me tell you what happened last week. This is like Frank Quattrone, Blodgett. Bank America initiated with a buy rating last week. What did they announce last night? A billion and a half dollar convert that'll end up being 1.725 billion with the extra shoe, whatever that might go. Bank America is the lender and the agent for the company, obviously. I just find that when I saw that, of course, the first thing I look at, now this company doesn't have a lot of debt. They do have term loans that are untapped from Bank America and so forth. But it feels like, and by the way, smartest thing these companies can do right now is raise capital. Do it. That, to me, is what you want to see. If you're bullish on it, yeah, maybe the stock, of course, the stock didn't come in like it should have, but where are we in this 99, 2000 kind of- Wait, before media? you answer that question, I want to be clear when you say it didn't come in. The stock on the back of that news that would happen on Wednesday night, while you were sitting on the desk of Fast Money, the stock was up 36% today, Thursday, the next day. So- well, you know, the you, leaking might have occurred the previous two days, and people were and setting we up saw the sell into it. But, but yes. my point, but to yes. your point, like there, there that are just, many strange things. Anyway, please, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I mean, I won't, I won't comment on you know. Nor should you, the, but the, just the, equity offering and all. But like, I mean, the the the, the similarities to, to the late '90s are that we're having a a massive build out in one particular area. In the '90s, it happened to be telecom equipment, fiber optic stuff. And that was a lot more, that was a lot bigger, okay? And it was being funded by, you know, debt that the carriers were putting on their books. Now we're seeing a lot of stuff being funded by companies who are cash rich, the hyperscalers, or VCs that are being funded by sources that, you know, you, know, you might say to yourself, well, that seems like a little bit of a, of a circle. Mm -hmm. So that's similarity, okay? And there's this, there's almost like a, like a, like a, like a uh, chase by the people, you know, it, it sort of it, it creates a, uh, you know, like a double virtuous, order, a triple order. Virtuous cycle. Yeah, you're like, oh, I got to get this stuff and, you know, prices go up then. And so, look, I, the, the, as, as Danny said, like, I don't know where the, you know, where it becomes a, like a flatter growth sort of, uh, sort of, sort of situation, but like things can't grow to the sky and, you know, eventually it'll, it'll peter out and it, it won't be the end of this. It won't be the end of AI. Okay. But it'll be a pause. Yeah. But it's interesting. You know, when you think about this company, Supermicro, which is in the Russell 2000, it's a 50 plus billion dollar market cap company, right? So they just did this convert that converts up 35, 40%. Um, and it's like, uh, you know, zero to a half a percent coupon. Okay. So think about that. Okay. So in the height of the, the the frenzy in 2021, we were saying the same thing. Any of these companies, you know what I mean, who could raise capital, sure. especially when rates were where they were, they were doing 100% conversions, zero coupon. Like yep. it was free money. Yep. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Meme like, stocks were yeah, doing it. Right. And so some of those companies, like th that actually ensured their existence, That's you know right. what I mean, as the stocks came in. So it, it's just interesting how the, the narrative is going to be pretty similar a lot of these companies that are, are like like really you know had these great gains off of this 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 trend right now um but the terms they're not that much worse yeah. like mike so what does that say to you about what's going on in the capital markets well right? two things i would say about that is if a in the late 90s there were incredible amount of ipos and deals right now there's none i mean so so like there is a lot of like like that's actually a positive for the technicals of the market there's not a lot of supply of new supply so when you when you have something that's hot it, can, it gets sold quickly. Well, okay, so I've been making this point too. If you have an S&P and a NASDAQ at all time highs, okay, if you have obviously rates, you know, Fed funds is, at, you know, five and a half percent, but relative to inflation, you know what I mean? It's it's really not that out of whack right, right. now. If you can't bring not only IPOs, there right. aren't secondaries right now. Like we're not seeing that, you know, you know what I mean? So you're seeing a few converts here, which are for all intents and purposes, not too different. But I, I guess my point is, is like, if companies don't feel confident about market conditions right now, what does that say about the underpinning of the market that we have? Well, I don't know if it says anything specific about the, it, what it says is it's a very narrow market, once again, right? Where like certain things will sell like hotcakes, okay? But a lot of things are not that saleable. And that's what we see in, like, that's why we have this bifurcation in the stock market. So there's probably a lot of, there's probably a lot of stuff for sale that the market doesn't want. All right, so if I'm an owner of some of this stuff I paid a higher price three or four years ago, I don't want to come out and bring it at a 50% discount, right? So it's just, it's, it's, it's once again, it's a market of haves and have nots. Well, here, here's a good example. So this just hit the tape as we were talking that Reddit, and this has been, you know, rumored for like the last few weeks is going to come to market. And it's going to be what, a low to mid single digits billion sort of IPO. And they're going to do something kind of funky. They're going to give a bunch of shares to their, you know, their users and everything like that. But interestingly enough, like a couple of stocks 
Well, one in particular that probably looks a lot like Reddit is Snap. It can't get out of its own way. It just gapped down 35% after its last earnings report. If Twitter was public, which is obviously not anymore, it would be trading on the balls of its, you know what? You, you know what I mean? So like, my point is, is like Reddit is probably not the one you want to test the market. Instacart was another one, right? Well, like we had the gig economy companies were doing really well under certain conditions during the pandemic. Instacart hasn't gotten out of its own way, you know what I mean, since it went public, uh, you know, five, six months ago or whatever. So it's just kind of interesting. I think you're making, you know, the point you made, it's like, and I'm not asking you to opine on any of these names, you know what I mean? But it's like, are these the things that investors are really pining away for? If you were some new process in and around training large language models, or you had some graphics chips, you could bring that to the market right now. You're going to do great. It would be, it would be like 2021 all over. That's right. And and that's the other difference between now and the late 90s. In the late 90s, it was much broader. And there were like, okay, we have a couple of companies that are growing like ridiculous, you know, revenues. In the late 90s, you remember this, Dan. I mean, you had many, many companies growing 25% sequentially revenues. Okay. Like, I mean, like 50, 60, 70 companies like that, big companies. We don't have that today. So that's why when something comes along, whether it's GOPs or AI, and there's nothing else really going on out there, it's like all the capital just gets sucked into yeah. these into these themes that's what and that's what's going on i want to i want to take a like i want to take a step back here and, and guy i think you kind of know this but this is really for our listeners so mike and i um you covered me at morgan stanley in the late 90s as this inflation or as this you know dot-com bubble was inflating okay and you know it's interesting because you never had high highs and you never had <laughs> low lows i mean like i'm going back to that period right. and i'm thinking about the conversations that we used to have and then you know, as the as the time turned, right, like from 2000 to 2001, 2002, you were always trying to be constructive. You're always trying to find narratives and that sort of thing. I think it's really important because here we are 25 years later and your mindset is not too different. You know what I mean? Like, I, and I think that's really interesting. And Guy and I have spent a lot of time, you know, on our pods trying to reflect a little bit on the 2000s and the late 90s. And I came into the market in 1997 and every year, there was something traumatic happen, right? Whether it was Russia or whether it was, you know, Asia debt crisis mm -hmm. or long-term capital or, uh, you know, people trying to call it top because of valuation or whatever. So we've all seen this before. I guess what I'm saying right now is that, and you alluded to this, Mike, a little bit, is like with NVIDIA gaining a trillion dollars in two months, okay? Like it's pulled forward so much enthusiasm about what the chip space can do in and around this. And to me, I think that's very dangerous. And then when you back it out and you look at everything else that's going on in and around tech, it's just not that exciting right now. So right. like speak, speak a little bit about that from a point of history and how people realize that about the internet, because it was supposed to change everything in 99, but then it wasn't really in two, 2004 or five where people started to get, oh, this is what it means for e-commerce. This was, you know, what it means for these other parts of the economy. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this is something I've thought a lot about, but you know, if you really think about the nineties, um, it started with the PC revolution with windows 3.0, right? When windows 3.0 came out, that was when they had the icons, they kind of ripped off, uh, yeah, they ripped off Apple's icon and because everybody used the Apple, then they said, oh, this is great. So everybody got a PC on their desktop. That was 1990, okay? It took five years before that really manifested itself into like a productivity boom. Now, to me, the real catalyst for the internet was in 1995, we had two killer apps. We had the browser and we had email. Like, oh, these are pretty easy. This is pretty cool. So my desktop. Guy, guy got them in like 2005. <laughs> in 05, <laughs> guy, guy got them both. I don't even know what a desktop <laughs> yeah, is, yeah, but yeah, please. Yeah. But I mean, think about like the productivity, immediate productivity benefit at work. I mean, we're just like to fax the morning notes to people and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like now you email stuff, you write these things, you know, you can, you can get on the internet and get information. It was, you think it was, you know, misinformation today. You should have seen it back then. But like, <laughs> you know, you, you, you had Yahoo dialogue. message yeah, boards. Whatever, oh, yeah, same thing, same idea. And, but it was like, in, like everybody could, figure it out. It wasn't difficult. Okay. And so today I think we're, we're, we don't have a killer app yet for AI for the average person. Now where I think AI is having a, a big impact is coding. And we're seeing that we're seeing layoffs as a result of mm -hmm. that, by the way, in the legal profession. Okay. Maybe some financial applications like white collar jobs, uh, maybe things like that, but it's not pervasive. It's not in our day. Like it's not changing the way people engage on a day-to-day -day basis with the internet to make their lives more productive. So then of course that evolved 
um, in the late night. It turned into then it turned into like a runaway freight train because like oh my god we have this internet thing we have to build it out. And how many companies went bankrupt in that process? A lot. Okay, because they are the ones who had to pay the toll. And then to your point, the real winners of the internet were the companies that then rode free on the platform that somebody else paid for. All right, and those are the you know those are the, the e-commerce companies. Those are the social media companies. Those are you know, some of the existing companies that understood, hey, this is an incredible platform. All the SaaS companies built business of cloud, but that was all paid for by somebody else. Those companies went bankrupt. So that we're just, we're, it's very early days to me. Um, now, it probably will be accelerated a little bit from the, from the last time we went through this, but it takes time. Well, yeah, but I guess, you know, again, you know, if you think about really the biggest thing in the last, and you know this better than anyone, the convergence of Wi-Fi and then mobile okay. and then social, right? Like it's been, reams have been written about that. And that's what really ushered in this new age, right. you know what I mean? A multi-trillion dollar platform companies and the like. And so I guess what I say- but that took time too, though, Dan, no, remember? It, I mean, yeah. the smartphone came out in the first one in 05. Yep. I mean, BlackBerry was- even earlier than that, but like the real smartphone was the first iPhone in the mid 2000s. But like those businesses didn't really 2007 benefit I mean, they were until selling the, hundreds like of 2014. Thousands. Okay, it yeah. took it took a while for the business to develop on that. Well, that and that's I guess so. Like, and guy, this is something that you know. Again, maybe you can opine on this. Is like when we think about you know Microsoft at three trillion, we think about Apple, um, which you know has two billion iOS installed base, but no AI, right? You know, you think about some of these large, you know, obviously the hyperscales, Amazon, it should be well positioned. You know, Google should be well positioned. Microsoft's cloud obviously should be well positioned. But again, if they're the ones who spent all the money, right, to train all the models and buy all the GPUs and build all the servers and, and you know, that sort of thing. And then obviously, once you get to this other phase of these folks, you know, you know, on the back of that, it's going to become commoditized at some point in the not so distant future. And these companies might not be the ones that reap the benefits in the not you know in, in the next few years they might have accrued the value right now in the stock market that's what makes me mike a little nervous because you know at some point in the year 2000 yahoo posted one too many banner ads right you know what i mean or you know one of those c laid one too many pieces of fiber and the whole thing came crashing down yeah and there's 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 reason to believe that that could be the case for this, I don't mean like the sort of dot com crash, but I mean no. a meaningful pullback. The big difference there, as you know, is that, that you know the, the part of the reason the, the internet crash was it was debt financed, mm -hmm. and they couldn't afford to pay that debt down. This is all equity financed. I mean, these companies are cash rich, so it's just you know it's like a private equity invest. You know, they burn cash, but it's equity, so like it doesn't. There's no systemic effect. To me, the exciting part about what's going on, and it's just it's premature, but we're, we wrote a note about this not too long ago. There's the enablers, which we all know, the picks and shovels are building this stuff out. Okay, great. They're benefiting today. But it's really the adopters. Like, who are going to be the early adopters of this new technology that really make their business way more competitive? You know, there's, there's now uh, companies that are, that are designing software that are going you know, to maybe eat the lunch of some existing software players because their stuff's too expensive and they can do this much more cheaply. Um, coders, as I mentioned, and just kind of writ large. I mean, you know, legal profession. I mean, education, I think, is an interesting area. It's not ready for prime time yet, but that to me is going to be like the big winners are going to be the ones who actually use this technology. They adopt it, they embed it into a new solution that's better, mousetrap is cheaper, and it's more profitable. Understanding that valuations are not a timing mechanism. I think we've all learned that the hard way over our careers, but. You know, Warren Buffett is still sort of the gold standard, and he, the Buffett indicator is out there, and that's basically the market cap of the U.S. equity market divided by U.S. GDP. And historically, somewhere between 100% and 125%, he considers the market to be fair valued. Currently, we're north of 180%. Understanding now that a lot of these companies have international exposure, so maybe you shouldn't look at it apples to apples. But even with that said, you're still talking about a number that is flashing red. So they're all, and there, listen, I could probably rattle off five or six other types of things. My question to you is when does valuation matter? When it matters. No, it's, <laughs> well, no, that's true. That's, that's no, the mean, answer. Well, first of all, I, I mean, there's many parts of the market that are dirt cheap, like energy stocks mm -hmm. and material stocks, and maybe even some financials that are getting thrown out with the bathwater. Okay. Um, and some tech stocks. Okay. There's some tech stocks that, aren't overvalued and we, you know, maybe they haven't emerged yet, you know, new emerging uh, businesses. Healthcare seems really inexpensive to me. So it's a, it really is a tale of two, two cities right now. And the reason why I can't get excited 
about this being like some new, like the, a new bull market is emerging is because these other part these stocks aren't participating. Mm -hmm. right? I've never seen like a, like a new bull market beginning with bad breath, right? So the, the breath has to improve. Um, that's, you know, my guess is, you know, like the, the, like the, the really good outcome would be there's this smooth handoff between the overvalued stocks to the undervalued stocks because they actually, we do orchestrate an incredible soft landing, the global growth improves and, you know, rates don't get out of control and we somehow throw the needle on all the stuff and that would be great. More likely what will happen is the, the expensive stocks, and by the way, they don't have to be all the MAG7, there's mm -hmm. expensive stocks that are not MAG7, they get re-rated, okay, and we have an event of some kind, rates come down and then the market broadens out. And 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 look, I mean that we're just the market's not going there right. Now. It doesn't want to go there yet. So, so you know, again, as, as we were speaking, you know, S and P just literally gapped higher, and it's you know, it looks like it's off to the races here. Um, when you speak to clients, let's just say we're going to be in this lull period. Earnings are pretty much done. We're going to get some retail earnings over the next, you know, sort of week or so. I think Walmart kicked it off with a bit of a bang, and 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 so that there might be some one-off disappointments. What you had to say about the consumer, I think, is really important, but Pretty soon, um, a lot of investors are going to get focused on the election here. Um, mm -hmm. There, you know, we have you know some geopolitics um, that don't seem to be. They're not likely to get better. When you think about um, the situation with Israel and Gaza, it, it, this is going to be politicized into the election. The situation with China is going to be politicized into the election. Obviously, the situation with Russia. Ukraine. So things get sloppy from a narrative standpoint. And, you know, we're already seeing some of the polling, you know, as far as U.S. consumers, the irony about this market and housing prices and 50 year low unemployment and wages where they are and that sort of thing is like the U.S. consumer, when they're asked the question about how they feel about the economy, they feel like shit. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't, I can't figure it out. And so we're going to get, it's going to be trench warfare from now until November 5th, maybe till Jan 6th, to be, <laughs> be honest, depending upon, you know what I mean? Like how you feel about this. So how important do you think this is going to be as far as like the U.S. economy, markets, risk asset prices? And the so like, I mean, historically, uh, the market usually doesn't worry about the or start thinking about the, uh, the, mar uh, the election until basically June, July during the conventions, right? Then it says, okay, we know who the candidates are. We've seen their platform. They roll it out, and then we and then the market starts making bets on who's going to win and what that means for certain sectors and styles. The other thing I would say, which is you know not happening so far this year, is usually the market at the index level doesn't do a whole lot mm -hmm. until the fall, when it becomes clear who's going to win. So that pattern doesn't seem to be playing out. In fact, it's interesting. Uh, you know, when Trump uh, won New Hampshire, uh, basically there were some movements in certain sectors and stocks that said, oh, he's going to win the whole election. So maybe things are happening faster now. Okay. What I can tell you is that it's not clear to me that we even know who the candidates are going to be. I don't think this is a crazy statement to no, say. A, a guy thinks that, but I mean, the betting markets are suggesting that it's pretty clear, which is interesting because a lot of smart people that I talk to, like Guy and you, I'm going to put you guys in the same bucket, are in that same camp, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. I just, I just don't think you can be confident that you know, Trump's, you know, legal issues don't prevent him from running. And, you know, Biden has some obvious health, you know, concerns, or at least, you know, people are asking about it and maybe he decides not to run. So, you know, I think those are real questions that the, the market has to kind of wrestle with. And then you throw a new candidate into the cauldron who may have a totally different position. So it's going to be wild. I mean, and by the way, it's not all bad. It could create some new opportunities in some of these beaten down areas. Like maybe, maybe the political sort of angst uh, we get just get past the event. It can release animal spirits into some of these areas that have been unloved. Okay, and and I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. You know, the All Star Game in sports is pretty much a popularity contest, but the true test is when you become an All Pro in football because you get voted All Pro by your peers. So it's one thing to be in the Pro Bowl. <laughs> it's another thing to be an All Pro, and each year you get voted by your peers into the Pro Bowl, the number one. So. We're fortunate to have you now for the seventh time, and we look forward to number eight. Thank you, Mike Wilson. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>